So, good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time it is when you're listening or watching this, to everyone out there in computer land. Today, as we record, Tuesday. is due the 2nd of February, called Candlemas. Candlemas is the festival of the presentation of the Lord at the temple. In accordance with Jewish tradition, this is 40 days after Christmas Day, hence today. Today, we remember this event. We learn a bit about it and the history and traditions associated with it. And we hear the story from the Bible and spend some time thinking about that particular story. So as we come now to worship, I'm going to read a short psalm just to bring us all to worship. This uh, psalm is sometimes known as the universal call to worship. So praise the Lord, all you nations, Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his steadfast love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. So we come now perhaps to our Methodist tradition as we join in singing our first hymn. And I hope that some of you will have hymn books and can join in there wherever you're watching this. Our first hymn is Born in Song. So we come to our first series of prayers. Unlike ourselves, the Anglicans do have a tradition of a Candlemas service. So these prayers are those set for Candlemas in the Anglican Church. So let us pray. Almighty Father, whose Son Jesus Christ was presented in the temple and acclaimed the light of the nations, grant that in him we may be presented to you and in the world may reflect his glory 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the prayer of confession. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us then bring our secret sin sins into this light and confess them in penitence and faith. Eternal Father, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in what we have thought and said and done, and in what we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. So we come then just to think a little of this candle mass festival and the traditions associated with it. It was begun as a Christian festival back in the fourth century in Jerusalem and is celebrated by all the Orthodox churches to this very day. Anglicans also have a service uh, at this time. They call the festival Christ in the Temple. The Roman Catholic Church used to call it the festival of the purification of the Blessed Virgin, but in the 1960s they did change their minds a bit on this and called it festival of presentation of the lord so really a very similar idea the name candlemas probably is originally derived from the story which we'll hear shortly and from simeon's prophecy of jesus as a light for and a revelation to all of the gentiles this tradition of a light and lights in medieval times were nearly always candles, uh, got associated with the physical and seasonal process of making candles during the winter, when work, work on the land was much reduced. These candles would then be given to the church and blessed at the church during the Candlemas festival. In some churches, a procession of these candles emphasizes this, this prophecy and the gift to the church. The part of Mary in the festival is also sometimes reflected by asking mums who've given birth in the previous year to lead the procession and to bring in the candles. It's the final end of the Christmas and Epiphany season. So it's your last chance now to get down and put away all those ornaments from the Christmas time. So if those lights are still hanging rather sadly across your garage, then now's the time to get rid of them. And in fact, in many European churches, the crib scenes stay on display until Candlemas. So there is some uh, precedent for still having decorations out at this time, but not beyond. Also associated with some of the routines of, of secular life, a candle mass time uh, was a time when rents would be due, uh, when tenancies would be agreed, when servants would be appointed for another year or dismissed if their services uh, were no longer required, and uh, of which academia was arranged. In fact, if you were in Scotland, you would notice that the more traditional Scottish universities still use the term. And if you were at St Andrews, you would be currently starting the second semester, which is called Candlemas term. So we follow this tradition today in a slightly paired back way. It, I'll now light a candle and invite you to light one with me. The daily candle prayer that they say at our local primary school at Churchill is, is a good way to accompany this. So let's pray. We light this candle to remind us of Jesus, the light of the world. Shine on us today and always. Amen. So we're going to go on now to sing again. We visit the Advent section of the hymn book for the last time, as this is the last 
possible time of that Christmas and Epiphany season. Our next hymn is Off the Father's Love Begotten. This is a very uh, old hymn which comes from about the time when Candlemas was first instituted as a festival. So, Off the Father's Love Begotten. Our reading comes from Luke chapter 2, and I read from verses 22 to 40. Jesus is presented in the temple. The time came for Joseph and Mary to perform the ceremony of purification, as the law of Moses commanded. So they took the child to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be dedicated to the Lord. They also went to offer sacrifice of a pair of doves or two young pigeons as required by the law of the Lord. At that time, there was a man named Simeon living in Jerusalem. He was a good, God-fearing man and was waiting for Israel to be saved. The Holy Spirit was with him and had assured him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's promised Messiah. Led by the Spirit, Simeon went into the temple. When the parents brought the child Jesus into the temple to do for him what the law required, 
Simeon took the child in his arms and gave thanks to God. Now, Lord, you have kept your promise, and you may let your servant go in peace. With my own eyes I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light to reveal your will to the Gentiles and bring glory to your people, Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at the things Simeon had said about him. Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is chosen by God for the destruction and the salvation of many in Israel. He will be a sign from God, which many will speak against, and so reveal their secret thoughts. And sorrow, like a sharp sword, will break your own heart. There was a very old prophet, a widow named Anna, daughter of Phanil, of the tribe of Asher. She had been married for only seven years and was now 84 years old. She never left the temple. Day and night she worshipped God, fasting and praying. That very same hour she arrived and gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were waiting for God to set Jerusalem free. When Joseph and Mary had finished doing all that was required by the law of the Lord, they returned to their hometown of Nazareth in Galilee. The child grew and became strong. He was full of wisdom, and God's blessings were upon him. We give thanks to God for his word to us today. Amen. And so in response to God's word to us and in celebration of Simeon's affirmation of the baby Jesus, we're going to uh, sing our next hymn, which is Faithful Vigil Ended. Faithful Vigil Ended Marching, waiting, cease Master God, your servant Is discharging down the church and we're standing in front of a stained glass window here in Churchill which depicts this story of Simeon and Anna in the temple. Uh, on the la left hand side we have Joseph looking sort of old and uh, grey. Uh, we have a very young Mary kneeling down in the centre of the picture and then centre spot is Simeon who does most of the talking in the story that you've just had. And then to his right we have Anna, uh, an old prophetess, and I, I think the artist's been quite kind to her. She doesn't look anything like 84 in this particular image. But uh, again, a useful way of just seeing uh, the, a picture of how the story uh, might have looked, albeit the Victorian version. So let's learn a bit more about what's going on here. The, the story this morning is really one of routine, followed by a quite miraculous wow time of prophecy, and then falling back into routine again. So let's talk about that, that early Jewish routine, which we see being played out here. This uh, ritual that happened after childbirth was really twofold. The first thing that needed to be done for Jewish law was the purification of the mum after childbirth. So 40 days after birth, the woman undertook a ritual purification and was then readmitted to temple worship. Up until that time, she wouldn't have been allowed to attend the, te the temple. Your 
given over to the Lord, the firstborn of every womb, is a verse from Exodus which describes the second uh, of these uh, rituals which took place. So Moses laid down that every firstborn male from every womb, including human, the human, would be ta taken over to the Lord and dedicated at the temple. Of course, for many of the animals, that meant the end, because they got sacrificed. The firstborn son wouldn't be sacrificed, but would be redeemed by swapping him for another form of sacrifice. Uh, if you look uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 13, you'll find all sorts of bloodthirsty uh, references to donkeys and lambs and how one could be substituted for the other. Uh, but the what... The, the Joseph and Mary family were doing here was sacrificing two turtle doves, which was the minimum required. So it does suggest that Jesus' family were not well off. There are all sorts of references back that this tradition probably encompasses. It, initially, it's probably all to do with the Passover, when the firstborn sons and all the firstborn animals of Egypt were killed by God, and that was the final thing where he, the Pharaoh released the, the Israelites. And we come across similar situations again with Isaac when he's uh, not sacrificed, uh, but his dad has to be prepared to make that sacrifice, but he is substituted uh, for uh, uh, an animal, I think a ram in that case. And also uh, the story of Samuel, and Eli, the high priest, Samuel's mother, Hannah, decided that when she dedicated him at the temple, then that would be a lifelong dedication. And once he was weaned, he was brought back to live there uh, all his life. And of course, became a very famous prophet in his own right. So we move on perhaps to this central part of the story, this strong and powerful prophecy affirming the Messiahship of Jesus. The text taken from the story is usually verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The, the maker of our stained glass mint window made the same decision. And in fact, those words uh, in a different translation are included at the bottom of the window. Simeon also predicts pain and sorrow for Mary indicating that Jesus' messiahship will not be one of earthly kingship and rule, but one of service and sacrifice. Anna then endorses Simeon's prophecy. Thus, right at the start of Jesus' life, it's clear in a prophecy from God via Simeon that Jesus has come for the Jews and Gentiles alike. His saving grace is for all people. So this very dramatic central part of the story ends and the family return to routine. Back they go to Galilee, to Nazareth, to the work of the carpenter's shop, to the hard daily housework for Mary, the grinding of grain, the making of bread, the tending, preparing and cooking of vegetables. Probably not much meat, much too expensive. Maybe a little fish, the Lake of Galilee is not too far away. And Jesus grew strong, and Jesus grew wise, and God's favour was upon him. And that's all we hear until Jesus was 12, and he appears again in the temple, debating with the scribes and all present. So obviously that wisdom of his first 12 years uh, did come to pass. So what does this story mean for us today? First and foremost, it's an assurance. Jesus is the Messiah. He has come to redeem all people. His work of redemption will be sacrificial and will cause his mother great pain. Secondly, for all of us, it's a challenge. We are charged as believers to reflect the light of Jesus into the world around us. I'm reminded of a lovely little Sunday school hymn that I have sung in my youth about 60 years ago or so now. Some of you may also know it. This is how the first verse goes. Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light. 
like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, so we must shine. You in your small corner and I in mine. And the hymn goes on to exhort us to shine for Jesus in worship to him and then to shine for others as we serve and minister to them. So we close our thoughts this morning with a candle mass prayer. So let us pray. Lord God, you are the source of everlasting light. Your son, our beloved Lord Jesus, was presented in the temple 40 days after his birth. He was recognized by Simeon and Anna and welcomed as the promised Messiah. May we, like them, behold the glory of the Lord Jesus. Grant that we may stand before you with hearts cleansed by your forgiving love. May we serve you all our days and make your name known as we worship you as our Lord. So may we come by your grace to eternal life. Amen. And so we now sing our final hymn for today's service, standing in that blazing light of Jesus and praising him, we sing, Lord the Light. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us, set us free by the
we just come to now a short time of intercession, as we just come to God and ask for those things which are on our hearts. So let us pray. So Father, we have come into your light today. We appreciate all that you have done for us and we praise you for it. And we come through you now to ask for the things which trouble us. We ask you to bring peace into a troubled world, a world where war has come even into Europe and still rages in many other parts of your world. We think of a world that we are in the process of ruining by overconsumption. We ask that you will send wisdom to leaders and to individuals so that we can all do our part to reverse the climate emergency. We ask you to be with our families, with our congregations, with all our friends and those that we know. We just share a few moments of silence now as we think of those dear to us and what we would ask for them. And so we draw our thoughts together as we share the Lord's Prayer using the more modern form. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So as we close our service, I share a blessing with you, a verse from 1 Corinthians, from chapter 15. So therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. And I invite you, as I say the grace, to share that with me wherever you may be. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>